All right, folks, it's 7 p.m., so I guess we can get going here. Hope you all had a good day today. We had a beautiful day, a little bit of rain this morning, then uh, it was a cool 80-some degrees, <laughs> it was a nice breeze, so it, it, it was uh, livable, as, as they say, all right, and uh, so it's, it's good to have you uh, with us. Now, we're going back to Colossians in chapter number one. You want to go back there and I'd like to read you a quote from C.S. Lewis from his book uh, The Weight of Glory and, and I read this it's it, it's kind of neat <clears throat> gives you a perspective on people but he says this there are no ordinary people you have never talked to a mere mortal. Your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Now that, that is something to think about, okay? And uh, so I, I thought it was, it was kind of clever there, the, the way he put it. You never talk to a mere mortal, all right? Everybody's different, aren't they, you know? And, and men created after the image of God, so it, it gets you to think about what's going, no matter what, what their morality is or anything. You know, it, it all depends how we see them. But at any rate, uh, let's come on over to uh, verse number 12, right? And I'd like to read 12 through 14 here again. And actually, I, I'm just calling this study. It, it, it'll be a short little study. Notes on being rescued, all right? Uh, so verse 12 says this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, all right? The forgiveness of sins. Now. I want to read that to you out of the <laughs> Message Bible, just verses 13 and 14, where it says this, God rescued us from the dead end alley and dark dungeons. He set us up in the king kingdom of his son he loves so much. The son who got us out of the pit we were in, got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating. Uh, I've been enjoying reading this and the Passion Translation, Mr. Woos, because I kind of bring things into to the uh, to where we live, uh, the culture where we live. I've been doing some reading and some studying about the culture of America, you know, and, and from the year 2000, and the fellow calls it a river of culture. And you can, you can visualize a river flowing through a land. And then the side, the river, on either side, he, he puts things of, of the culture that we live in. And what he does, he dares you to go back to the culture when this, well, the Old Testament had a, its own culture. Then the New Testament had its own culture. These people all had different cultures than us. In other words, different authorities different ways to live and and that sort of thing and so what the gentleman's talking about is when when we are reading the scriptures we need to get into the culture of the people it was written to you know as, as we see that audience relevance this sort of thing and it was just a new look for me to, to see that so I, I thought it was interesting but as we look here at uh verses 13 and 14 uh and in verse 13, he says, rescued us. And from what? The domain of darkness. When I come back, you can stay where you are. Uh, when I come back to chapter 6 in the book of uh, Ephesians, and verse number 12, it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world uh, forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, being 
uh, a person that believes in fulfilled theology, um, understanding that Satan has been taken care of, then also I believe personally that when you read a verse like Ephesians 12 or 6, 12, that these forces have been neutralized also, okay? And so for us today in our culture, it comes from men, different men. But then in verse 14, he says, transferred us. Now transferred has the idea of power. And where did he transfer us? To the kingdom of his beloved son or the son of his life. Now, think about this for a minute. When you see the word transferred, what does that kind of bring to mind to you? You know, from one place to another. And I was thinking of this, and I looked up in the Mounts' Greek and all that sort of thing, where the word transplanted shows up. So he transplanted us from this darkness, as you know, the the dark alley, the pit that you see in the Message Bible, okay, into the kingdom of his dear son. And and actually was, you know, thinking, uh, Susan and I planted some new plants in, in her garden, her English garden in the back. Some were thriving there in the full sun, but some weren't thriving. So we went to the internet to see why, and, and so some require only a morning sun some require an evening sun some some you know sun all day long so we had to transplant those plants that were getting sun all day long and put them into the situation that they belonged in and you know what they're thriving now and so as, as you and i have been placed into the kingdom of god's son it gets exciting to think that we've been transplanted into a place where we can actually thrive all right now watch this because this is a i don't know if you've ever tried to do a study on kingdom and i've been looking at that and hope to come up with something for you here in the next few weeks but in the word kingdom uh nope oh, somebody's waiting to get in brother carl okay uh the word kingdom appears 162 times in the New Testament, or from Matthew to Re Revelation. Now, I, I didn't count how many times, or ask Siri how many times it's in the Old Testament, but it, it's, it's a few pages in the concordance, okay? But here's what I find very interesting. Of the 162 times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's only eight times where Jesus, the Son of God, or the Christ, is referred to as it being his kingdom. Okay, uh, watch this with me. It, it, let, let's follow this. Come back to Matthew 16, please. Okay, Matthew 16, very familiar verse. Uh, <clears throat> notice 28 with me, 16, 28. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom so this is the first mention of the kingdom being connected uh with the son or actually the son of man here in, in this case all right now if you come back to luke with me in chapter 22 luke 22 there's 17 Luke 22, let's notice verses 29 and 30. Well, let's start in 28. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you'll sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel all right then if you just slide to the next chapter chapter 23 please let me get my page turned here all right 23 and let's look at verse number 42 okay 
So this has to do with the thief, one of the thieves were on the cross. And in verse 42, and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And we remember the story about the two thieves uh, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And, and the Lord answers them, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise, he says. Okay. And, as you read that. Now, when I come over to John chapter 18. Okay. And verse number 36. This is with Pilate. Uh, during his trials, um, notice verse 35, Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews but as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. That's pretty plain right there. So if it's not of this realm, then it has to be of another realm, okay? That we call it the spiritual realm. Now, give me a little, let me give you a little testimony here. Um, I dropped Carl off. We, we were working this morning out, the, uh, out of our building there. And uh, on the way home, station I usually listen to, 1040 a.m., it's conservative talk radio and uh, it had a show on and I don't know who the speaker was but the fellow that runs Dr. Savage runs the uh, Bob Savage runs the station so he was on the program with this fellow and, and this guy's running for something in the city of Rochester but they were talking about the situation over in Israel with the Palestinians and the Israelis and this fellow wasn't too enamored with the Israelites and thought they went too far, you know, with their, their killing of Pan, uh, Palestinians. But a gentleman called in and he brought up some good points and then too bad he, he, he went far away. Where do we read that Israel as a nation ever carried the gospel anywhere? Well, you don't, right? But his thought and, and I've read this a lot of times by different people, is that the 10 tribes migrated, you know, by, by the Assyrians taken out, ultimately went through Europe and into England. So he says the kingdom of David is still in existence, but it's, the throne is in England. It's no longer in Israel because God has gotten rid of Israel. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people that think that, you know, and you go wonder where, where are they coming from? All right, where are they coming from? Especially after you read this, uh, the Lord's words that he gave to Pilate. Man, my, my kingdom's not in this realm. Okay, and to me that's, that, that kind of, you know, black and whites it there as you see it. But we come over to John, oh, we, we just were in John, I'm sorry. Uh, but back to Colossians then, uh, of course in 1.13, this is mentioned again, which we've already read. We've been transferred or transplanted into the kingdom of dear son. Now, when I compare that with 1 Peter chapter 1, one over there. Now, you folks can take these verses and go look at them and have a good time with them. Okay. 1 Peter chapter 1. And as I get there, verse number 11 says, Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Now, the glories to follow include him in a kingdom, all right? And that, that's what folks were looking at. Now, so those are the one, two, three, four, five, six passages that you see that however now come back to ephesians with me in chapter five okay ephesians chapter five and let's notice verse number five for this you know with certainty that no immortal 
or impure, uh, not mortal, immoral, excuse me, or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in a kingdom of Christ and God. Now, right there, they're connected, Christ and God. So when you turn to Revelation chapter 11, all right, Revelation 11, notice with me verse 15. Where it says, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now there, God the Father is called Lord, okay, and his Christ. We see that. So together, that, that's where we see him, all right? Now, so we say, well, what do we think about that? Well, you have to make your own determination. Uh, but Max King, in his mammoth book, The Cross and the Perusia, around uh, pages 40 to 42, uh, has a couple thoughts on that. All right. And what, what Max kind of believes is this, that during that 40 year period, uh, you know, from the ascension to the, to the Lord's coming in the clouds there, where we're going from old to new, and they're passing each other, that that's the kingdom of Christ. Okay? And then after the coming, now they're together in the kingdom of God and, and ruling together. So that's, that's his thought. All right? And that's probably the best thought that I've ever heard concerning that. But uh, people can get confused if they don't, uh, in, I don't know how to say this correctly, but if a person doesn't have a concordance, what can't he do? He can't compare words and words and where they're found and, and, and the context of them and so on and so forth. So uh, what we've been, what's happened with us then, we've been transplanted into a kingdom. Okay. If you want to say the kingdom of the Lord and his Christ, to me, that, that's fine. So we've been uh, uh, transplanted there. And to us, it's a matter of keeping our minds and our thoughts concerning where we are with authority. Now, our, our brother Bill Petrie wrote a great article on Romans chapter number uh, 13. Uh, concerning obeying the authorities on earth. It was, it's really good. I still have it downstairs. But as we perceive things, when the authorities on this earth go against our authority in the heavens, then what do you do? You know, Peter said it in the book of Acts. We must obey God and not men, right? So as you see that. So at any rate, uh, we've been... We've been transplanted or transferred into uh, this kingdom. Now, when we see 13 and 14, back to Colossians with me, please. Okay. When we see verses 13 and 14, what you're actually seeing here it is a summary of the divine work of redemption. And, it, of course, it, it involves his beloved son. So his is the father, the son is, is Christ. And then following that from verses 15, okay, to 23, we see what it's all about. So the first, these two first verses are, are a summary. And then as you read on, uh, then you get the whole scope of what's going on here. And I think Paul had a pattern that he did. He did this with a, a, a number of books. Um, I'm going to take you back to uh, Romans, if you would, in chapter number one. Okay, might help you understand here. Uh, Romans chapter number one and verses 16 and 17. All right, 16 and 17, he says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation 
to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now again, what we have here in 16 and 17 is a summary. Okay, a summary of what? Well, of the work of redemption, how it figures out. And you, you start reading verse 18 of chapter 1 and go all the way through to Romans chapter 8 and the last verse. So Paul gives you two verses here to summarize seven more seven more chapters is what it amounts to. Okay, and, and uh, that, that's kind of interesting as, as you see that. All right, so let's come on back then to, to Colossians here and, and see some things uh, concerning these, these verses, all right? So when we look at 12, 13, and 14, there's some words that kind of jump out at you. The word darkness, okay? Uh, <laughs> the dark alley there in the, you know, in the Message Bible. The word light, and in my in the New American Standard, it's it's capitalized, so we know that the saints in light, the saints in the light of Christ. Okay, inheritance is there, and then the word forgiveness or redemption, depending on what translation you're you're reading, are found found in these verses. Okay, so that's why I say they're they're like a summary of what's happening. And what's interesting to me, if, if you come back to Acts 26, okay, where Paul is giving a testimony here, and I believe it's of Felix, okay, Acts 26, and we pick it up in verse, uh, now let's see, okay, verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Okay, so when you read verse 18 in, in context of the rest, you know, of, of him meeting, meeting the Lord, what does he do here? He talks about darkness, light, forgiveness, and inheritance, just as he tells the folks in Colossae, all right, and tries to bring it into some sort of understanding for them and then continues on about the story of redemption and the person of you know Jesus Christ who who is he and you see that in chapter one there of, of Colossians so as you look at little things like this it kind of encourages me you know to where well where did Paul get the idea of this sort of thing well right here you know from the presence of God and and using God's words is, is what, what he's doing which are the best words you can have and can use here, all right? If, if you all can see that and, and understand that, all right? In, in fact, notice verse 23, as long as we're in that chapter, that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to be proclaimed light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles, okay? So proclaiming light, who was light? Well, Christ was proclaiming himself in him is life and 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 we all understand that i i hope okay as we go through this so come on back to colossians then with me and let's back up to 13 verse 13. now watch this i i 
I try to find things that are practical that I can speak with people about. All right. Uh, this afternoon, um, I was cutting cutting our grass at home, and once you know it, on my last pass, my mower ran out of gas, so I had to go down to the corner. And there's a young lady that works down there. Uh, she looks like she's about 12 years old, but she has a couple tattoos, so you know she's older than that. But she's a real nice kid. And a fellow before me was preaching to her, but not about the gospel. All right. And and when I came up to give her my money for the gas, she says, "Oh, the people would quit preaching to me." And I told her, I says, "You know." I want to let you know something. She says, what's that? You're not going to preach to me. And I said, no, ma'am. I said, Jesus loves you. And she just stared at me. And I said, sometime I'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about it when you're not so busy. But she didn't say anything negative, you know, which, which I appreciated. Okay. But here, for he rescued me. Now, uh, again, we have to look at some verses. And I want you to think of this in terms of rescue. Okay. I'll try to explain this. How about the word salvage? That's one of the words you find when you do a word study on rescue. The salvage. Okay. Uh, now watch this and, and see if this will flow with you. Come on back to Matthew 1. I have three verses here of the Gospels. Matthew chapter 1. And let's notice verse number uh, uh, 21. I said it is. Yes. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will, he will savage. You know, like a, a, a ship goes out and, and, and salvages a, another vessel or, or something. Okay? That's, that's the idea here. Uh, in Luke 19.10, we all know that, that verse, I think. For Son of Man has come to seek and salvage that which is lost. Okay? And then finally in John 3, if you would. Okay? John chapter number three, as you look at this, and notice verse 17, right after 16, 17, uh, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him or salvaged, okay? Salvaged uh, through him. The idea here, as you come back to Colossians, well, actually you can stay in John if you want, but if the whole idea here is that Christ drew himself to us or drew us to himself. You know, John chapter 12 there in verse 33. And I, if I be lifted up, I will do what? Draw all men to myself. That's a very practical verse there. He draws men to himself. Okay, and what are, they, what are they being delivered from? Their wretchedness, their condition of wretchedness, of being in the darkness. Okay, and and for audience relevance, when you're looking at you know uh, the time frame in the first century, uh, the, the, these these folks were in the dark under the darkness of principalities and powers. Okay, so uh, for them. And those that believed, what would it mean? If you taken out from underneath that authority and brought to the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the authority, and even today, uh, of the world, if you want to call it that, in men's minds, is utterly hopeless darkness and misery. That's what people live under. Okay? And, and, and to me, it's, it's a sad situation. A sad situation. But what happened? We were salvaged by God's mercy and grace. 
by his sending his son. And, and we all know this, all right? Sending his son in the flesh. Uh, come on back to Colossians with me again. And notice verse uh, 22 of chapter number one, okay? Chapter number one, 22, it says, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So the word was made flesh dwell among us. I mean, he, he volunteered to become one of us, all right, so that he could salvage us, if you please, okay? I'll give you a little salvage story before we, before we end here. Okay. And notice chapter 2 in verse number 9. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Christ still has a body now. Okay. I mean, he was raised from the dead, received that, I believe he received that spiritual body when he ascended, but he still has a body. And, and what is it? It's where deity dwells. Okay. Where deity dwells. And so that, that's good for us as, as, as we see that, okay? Uh, let's slide back to Galatians for a minute. I hope I'm not talking too quickly here. Galatians chapter 1. Okay. Notice with me verse 15 and 16, where it says, But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me, through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So he says, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Now, who is he revealing? Okay, the person of Christ in whom deity dwells. Okay, the fullness of deity dwells in Christ. Uh, chapter 4, if you would, and uh, verses 4 and 5 say this. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So that we might, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Again, redeemed, you could put that word salvaged in there, okay? You were salvaged. So, uh, he came in the flesh in order to die for our sins. And Paul reminds the folks in all his letters of that fact. Okay. There's one other thing that we need to see here and you need to consider is that in his resurrection. Uh, and, and, you know, I try not to divide the two. The cross work is... I mean, it's wonderful. The resurrection is a proof of who he was in, in terms of what he did. But uh, I'm going to go back to Romans 5. And, and these are familiar verses. But because he rose from the dead and now is at the right hand of the Father, we perceive that. I can read verse number 5 of chapter 5 of Romans. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And remember, he told the disciples earlier, unless I go, the helper can't come. And the love of God has been poured in our hearts, okay? Within our hearts, it says. Through whom? Through the Holy Spirit, all right? So to me, that's, that's a wonderful thing. So watch this. Come back to Col Colossians. There's many more verses you can look at in relationship to that, to God's love, giving the Spirit. But notice Colossians 1 and 6 and 7. Well, let me start in 5. Because of this hope laid up for you in heaven, of what you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Now notice, they heard it. What did they hear? The gospel. Okay. Which has come to you, 
just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit incre and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. So that's where they heard it from. Now, Susan would like me to do an article for the next newsletter on, on having ears to hear here. Well, watch this. Keep your hand here. I'm, I'm coming back. Okay. Come back to Psalms with me in, in chapter 40. Okay. Can you do that? Psalm chapter 40. 95, 73, 27. Okay. Psalm 40. Let me read some verses here in, in relationship to hearing. The thing about he that hears, has ears to hear, let him hear. When Paphras got the message from Paul, the gospel, took it back to Colossae with him, or, you know, himself, and, and began to preach it. And people began to uh, hear it. Now, I begin in verse 1. This is a Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. Now watch what it says. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction. Out of the miry clay. and set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who hath made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders which you have done. And your thoughts are, to are toward us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Now, now think about this. Why did this all begin? I mean, the, the, these words that David was able to, to write down. What was the beginning of this? You go right back to verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me and did what? He heard my cry. So God hears men, you and me, when we pray, so, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But more than that here, he inclined me to hear my cry, okay, and brought me up out of the pit of destruction. What's that sound like? Sounds like we just, what we're looking at here in Colossians chapter number one. It's, it's what the... Uh, message bible says <laughs> here okay and and look at the verse god rescued us from the dead end alley and dark dungeons and as you think about the people back in that first century the darkness they they lived in you know in, in authority so i think this is very important as you see this he heard my cry so god was listening okay listening to somebody and hearing somebody and real hearing ends up where? Not just in the mind, but in the heart. Okay? In the heart. And that's what happened with these dear folks in, in Colossae. All right? They heard it. You previously heard verse 5. The day you heard of it, it got into their hearts. Okay? And, and that's what has to happen with, with people. You know, it's just not a one-time thing. They hear the gospel, and you give them time to what? Think about it, okay? Think about what has been said and, and all that sort of thing. So when I come back to Colossians then, what is the result of all that, right? Well, when I go to chapter 2 of Colossians in 13, it says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. 
summary verses and we come here so he being brought forth from the grave the resurrection brought forth to us the light it brought forth the spirit of god the love of god and the life okay as you see here uh, uh as we have this okay so uh, to me you know a, a little word like a rescue then uh, that, I, that I look now as being salvaged uh, in life today, we're not rescued or salvaged, okay, to slavery, but rather to liberty. We've been taken out of slavery, see, and brought to a place of liberty that we have, okay? Now, let, let me end with a little story. I have a million stories. Okay. When I was on the ship in New York, the, the Morgenthal, 378 foot, we used to do these ocean stations, and we were 500 miles off of Bermuda. And uh, I spent Christmas and New Year's in Bermuda. Beautiful, most beautiful place I ever saw in my life. No cars. Motorcycles and little, little three-wheeled cars because it, it's not a big place. All the beaches are white. It's just a gorgeous. But from there, we went out to our ocean station, and we were out there for about two weeks, and, and we got an emergency call. A uh, oil tanker, 750 foot. Uh, one of their compartments with oil in it in the in the bow of the ship, the front of the ship blew up and the wheelhouse was, was on at the stern of the ship so nobody got hurt praise the lord for that okay but what the crew did was abandon ship immediately send out a message we're the closest vessel of any kind to them so it, it, it took us uh it, it took us about almost two full days to get there all right but within 75 miles of their location, we could see the black smoke from the sky. When we got close there, we could start seeing the, the, the flames coming out, okay? And I can smile about it now, but then it was very serious. And, and, and the black smoke just billowing out, and oil burning, okay? Now the crew was gone. All their boats were, were, were gone. I had no idea where they went. Okay, but as the smoke began to, the, the fire began to cease because of the oil was burned out, okay, that ship was totally black with soot and filth, okay, as, as we looked at that. Now, at the time, I was a bosom mate, E6 bosom mate, and we had two 40-foot uh, two, uh, boats. And so my job was to take a crew over there, the engineering crew over there, to see what they could do to salvage the situation, okay? And as we were there for four days uh, uh, doing this, okay, uh, and making sure it wouldn't sink, that sort of thing, but it was rolling so much that what it would do is uh, it would roll over, roll to the side, and it would pick water up, and then roll back and pour the water off the other side. And I'm glad I wasn't on the one of the boats when that happened. But at any rate, what happened was was this: the engineering crew that went over got the fire under control, put it out. But it was a mess. They were there to salvage that vessel. It wasn't pretty. It was ugly. All right, sitting there in water like that. And I try to think of us in terms. What were we inside before the Lord gave us the gospel? You know, use the saint of God to, to trans, transmit the gospel to us. And it got into our hearts. We were ugly in the darkness, in the void, in the dark alley, in the pit okay is where we were but he salvaged us see and and made something grand and good and holy 
in every other word you can think of, uh, think of, sanctify by salvaging us. Okay, now, now think about that. And and uh, I, I told a lady the other day, you know, depression in, in well, a, a fella into his life. I said you shouldn't feel that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That's where your heart needs to be, not in yourself. Because if you're depressed, what are you depressed about? The past. When you get anxious, what are you anxious about? The future. You should never be anxious nor depressed. Not with the Lord in your heart, because he salvaged you. Okay? Y'all got that one? Okay, pretty simple. All right, as, as you see that right here. Now, let me tell you the rest of the story. Paul Harvey always had a rest of the story. Okay. The, 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 the fellas, there were about 40 of them that went over, the engineering crew, to do what they did. They, they took everything they could get their hands on and brought it back to the ship. Okay. Even the, the wheel that you steer the, that, that huge 750 foot ship with. Okay. Well, Four days later, a salvage ship comes out of uh, Portugal to take it back to Portugal or Spain. And what happened was, was this. He got on and he inspected the ship. And he told our captain, I've never seen such an act of piracy in all my days. Because the fellows took everything. All right. So the captain panicked over that and called his congressman. So the congressman said, don't, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll have people at the dock when you pull in, okay? So what happened ultimately, the ship was not allowed to go into Portugal or Spain and they end up sinking it. So the salvage master got nothing. When we got back to New York City, here's a whole crew of people, lawyers, congressmen, Okay, that, that sort of thing. And the lawyer grabs the captain. He says, Captain, we need to, because we had gone, you know, the captain interviewed every person to see what they took and all that, gathered it all together so they could return it. And this congressman and the lawyer got the captain together in front of the whole crew and said, Captain, that ship belonged to you because the owners did what? They left it. All right, so that was your ship. You could have taken the whole thing and towed it back to New York with you. So all the guys that took stuff got to keep it, okay? And uh, so it was a happy ending, except the ship, our sister ship, made a, a, uh, a flag for us to fly from our flagstaff on the ship. And uh, after that, we were called Parker's Pirates. Parker was our captain, okay? So, but it had a good ending. And listen, the salvage of your life and my life by our Lord Jesus Christ is going to have a great ending. Okay, so keep that in mind. So God bless you all. Have a great rest of the week in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.